Um, okay. Yeah. Right. Now, can I see all the participants, please? Uh, I think only one has switched on the video, Kunal Kamal Malhotra. Ah, but I need, can I see all the names on the screen? Apna shakal dekhna to utna maza nahi aata. Aye, sir. Pranam Kabir ji. Pranam, Pranam. Yeah, view. We can have the gallery. gallery. That's it. You're sideways, uh, Sujit ji. Are you doing a special pose? <laughs> no, no, my camera was. Camera? You sure? Okay. Take her. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Sorry, I'm a little delayed. I was with a friend who um, gave me excellent coffee. I got distracted. Um, but he did give some sweets, which are at the back for everyone to enjoy later. Yeah. Who is new here? Okay. Thank you. How did you find out about us? Actually, uh, uh, I was uh, looking up since uh, I was looking to your uh, in Bodh Gaya if some teachings are given in, uh, for Buddhism. So I came across an institute called Root Institute. Very good. So from there, so I found there, so I was planning to go to Bodh Gaya. Mm. Four days, three days courses were there in Bodh, uh, Bodh Gaya Root Institute. You went there? No, no. I was, I'm planning to go. Okay. So after that, I found that... Uh, other centers in Delhi nearby. So I can go to and Good, good. Yeah, we're a sister center of Root. Uh, in fact, I work there. So yeah, come over one day, see the Buddha's uh, enlightenment place. It's an interesting place to say the least. Yeah, very good. So welcome everyone. And you've yeah, so, been with... Uh, actually, I practice Buddhism. So this, this one... uh, sorry, you what? I practice Buddhism. You practice Buddhism. Uh, I so many times. Oh, of course, of course. I thought you might be with Nagloka, Lokamitra, and all. This is here. Good. Did you do the three year course at Naglok or the two year? Hmm. Very good. Welcome. Jai Bhim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's start with some silence because I've already sp spoken too much. Um, we may have had as certainly the case with me, since waking up this morning, uh, unbelievable number of, uh, what shall we say, mind moments, mind moments, thoughts, images, memories, plans, uh, food, uh, met some friends. So, so many things have happened already in, you know, five, six hours. And what happens, what tends to happen is the mind can get very congested. I don't know if you ever had that experience. Like after you've been to a very good restaurant and you really had too much. And you only realize towards the end of the meal, you've had rather too much. And then later you feel a little uh, full, overfull. So that can happen with the mind. So let's uh, just be quiet for a little while and watch your body and your breath. You don't have to sit in any special way. There's not a meditation session. But if you sit upright, it can be useful, very useful for the flow of energy in your body. Uh, of course, make sure you're not aggravating any uh, back problem or so forth by doing that. But be comfortable and uh, make sure you're warm enough uh, so that, yeah, good. Uh, you have a cushion under your feet. That's good. Yeah. And the thing is, just I'll mention three things, although, again, I'm talking rather a lot. Keep three things in mind if you can. One, let the body be still for a little while. Mind is another matter, but at least let the body be a little still. Let, the, let there be a sense that, uh, what shall I say, you're allowing yourself to relax a little bit. You can be relaxed in the body and mind. Of course, that's a tall order, but it's the point is when this is not an exam. It's not, you're not here for, you know, some kind of competition to enter the police or army. This is just, you're going to relax. But the third point, awareness. Be very alert and awake. Um, but not with tension. Because of the previous factor, relaxation. You're relaxed but alert. It is possible. Okay, so stillness, relaxation, vigilance. 
awake like the Buddha. His very word Buddha means awake, fully awake. Okay, so let's sit and you can observe what is happening for you in the body. You can connect with your cushion in the chair. And then just, if you can, it could be useful to just be aware of natural breathing, breathing in and breathing out. Okay, breathing in, breathing out. The awareness of that, meaning the sensation of that, not the thought of it, the sensation of the breath as it enters and leaves your nostrils. Okay, we'll sit quietly for three, four minutes. Especially let go and relax with the out breath. Just let go with the out breath. Okay, <clears throat> and now after that very brief silence, we can create a very positive intention or motivation together, which is something that many people do in the morning anyway, whether they are so-called religious or spiritual or not. But in our tradition, our parampara, We'll talk about parampara later, what it means. Uh, in our tradition, <clears throat> handed down from 
the great sages, and in our case, mainly from Lord Buddha, uh, it can be very useful, essential actually, to remember uh, the motivation in the morning, as soon as possible upon awakening, and certainly before any kind of session like this together. So we can reflect on how <clears throat> we woke up in the morning, which is a great thing. Many people uh, did not. Many people, of course, died yesterday, uh, naturally, violently, in many different ways. It doesn't feel like one is going to die somehow when one is younger, especially, but it also this image, this ignorant uh, idea, concept continues, actually, probably until the day before one dies, for most people, or the few seconds before one dies, uh, most of us don't think we're going to die. Anyway, we do fear death, but there's also that contrary notion that, well, it won't be today, will it? So who knows? Anyway, gratitude for being alive, because there is a chance to engage with ourselves, engage with the world, which is what some people feel is uh, could be part of the purpose of life, Yeah, to engage <clears throat> understand oneself and the world and relate with it and develop one's total potential. The Buddha is someone who uh, awakened their deepest potential, we say, uh, totally established that potential in, in their mind, in his mind which made him forever not only free of any kind of pain or sorrow of, of the wrong sort, but also enable the Buddha to reach out, understand, uh, engage with beings, all manner of beings, seen and unseen, and be of benefit to them. So we could think... Uh, we could establish that kind of motivation that look up to now, I'm alive and I'm alive for many reasons. And one reason, major reason, is that I've depended and have been uh, fed and clothed and taken care of one way and another, <clears throat> directly or indirectly, by countless living beings, most of whom I don't know. And I will never know them because they may be living the other side of the planet. But it's due to them. It's due to farmers and shippers and truck drivers and men and women and all manner of beings and animals that I'm still alive. And of course, one's parents initially. The kindness of the parents, especially the mother, is especially uh, spoken about in the uh, Buddhist tradition. Hmm. So <clears throat> remember them. Remember your parents, remember the people who have been uh, most involved in your life, and think of all the people you don't know, who also have been the part of why we're here. The people behind your breakfast, for example, however simple it was, you can be sure, a multitude of beings involved with your breakfast, even if you just had some I don't know, some <clears throat> sukha chana or whatever. Uh, or if you had, of course, if like me, you like occasionally whole wheat toast and butter and Oxford marmalade, then of course, far more people involved that one can you know, think of. But whatever it is, we can be sure we are not self-made. We didn't make ourselves neither at the point of conception or birth, and neither since then at any moment have we been totally self-made. We've depended on others every single moment. And on the five elements, of course, and on the continuum of consciousness. Mm. So there's a whole maze, a whole web of interdependence in which we are living, in which we are enmeshed, so whether we are enmeshed and tangled up like a fish, 
struggling in a big net in the ocean or whether we are connected in a very positive and enlightened way, that is up to us, how we behave, how we work in the world, what we do with our minds, basically. So anyway, we motivate that uh, by having this little gathering together, listening to me and then discussing, it may be of some benefit for somebody. And it has at least has kept us off the streets out of mischief, you know. <clears throat> at least we won't, you know, be the cause of an accident on the road while we're sitting here. So uh, there is some benefit in being in a quiet place like Tushita hmm. with some very holy images uh, behind me and on the walls, which we believe in our tradition do have the power to influence the mind. I mean, they're not... Coca-Cola signs or go-go bars or, you know, uh, political slogans on the wall. There are other images which are, we believe, more beneficial for the mind. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> as I said, my talk, it was just off the cuff. I thought I'm coming back to Delhi. I'd like to connect with friends here and people and offer something back to this center, which has, uh, you know, been so close to my home for so many years. And, uh, yeah, keep me out of mischief for a few hours now and then. So, Oxford to Bodh Gaya, what a, what a title, yeah. From the gleaming spires of Oxford to the uh, wonderful stupa of Bodh Gaya, which you all must see if you haven't, especially nowadays because it's been beautifully lit up with the state-of-the-art lighting by uh, an organization, uh, a Buddhist organization, with the help of professionals, and it looks beautiful and very inspiring just to be there, especially when the lights are on. But at all times of day, it can be very inspirational to be at the place where the Buddha transcended sorrow, where he... Uh, you could say he had been engaging with, and battling is a strong word, but yeah, engaging with, working with the uh, disturbing states of mind, and where he finally emerged totally, again, victorious. Language is very, uh, you know, deceptive, but you could say victorious over the unwholesome emotions, and where he became a fully awakened person under that tree, the continuum of the tree, which is still there at Bodh Gaya. So a very powerful place, very, very powerful place, very, and made very beautiful now with uh, very meaningful uh, sculptures, relief work, quotations all around the campus there. So highly recommended. This is my plug uh, for Bodh Gaya. Of course, I could say, you know, visit Oxford. It's also very beautiful in its own way, medieval. But for that, you'll most of you need a visa and go to England. And, yeah, yeah, you know. But yeah, it's amazing. It's a center of learning. It's where I met Buddhism very strongly, powerfully. So I owe a lot to that university where I was studying history back in the mid-70s. The thing perhaps that is most important, or very important for me apart from meeting Buddhism, was what one of my uh, tutors, history tutors, told me, which is Kabir. Of course, he couldn't pronounced Kabir. Uh, he probably said Saxena or something horrible like that. He said, um, don't bother to go to the lectures that the historians give. Read their books. Their books have in a very clear, concise form exactly what they want to say. Of course, you know, put down very clearly, concisely, edited so that it reads well and you can quickly get the meaning. Don't bother to go, except there was one historian called A.J.P. Taylor, brilliant speaker. You know, like you think of Atal Bihari Vajpayee as a parliamentarian speaker, you know, so he was amazing. A.J.P. Taylor could bring history alive. But apart from him, they said, don't bother to go to any lecture. Unka kitab par. Kitab hai, toh. Kororo hai Oxford mein. Kitne art das library hai, jo amazing libraries. I mean, every college has their library, right? But we have some of the most amazing libraries in the world, I would think, at least in English language. Yeah. Uh, so read the books. So that's why today also, in uh, re to respect that advice, which I have since then found very useful, 
And also saves time, he said. You don't have to walk all the way to the lecture halls, walk all the way back, get distracted on the way, get distracted on the way back. Library mein baat ke, kitab padho unka. Fantastic advice. So that's what I do. And for my history essays, which I was very bad at writing during the day, I would stay up all night in the uh, Wadham College Library and uh, write my essays at night, surrounded by books and silence and the coffee machine, uh, hot chocolate machine downstairs in the junior common room. And some very, very dedicated card players would often be there playing at night, led by uh, actually an Indian student, expert Indian student. They would be playing Tash very often into the early hours. So I would have company in case I got lonely with the books. So niche jaake, button daba, hot chocolate, pio, apna essay likho. Point is books are can be very important, can be very, very important. And that's what I found. But, but I do want to uh, read something to you. Of course, that is also due to my fascination and belief in the power of uh, the word of books. But this very quotation I'm about to read you is um, showing the poverty, if you like, of uh, words or the limitation of words. And this is being said in spite of the extraordinary literature we have in the world of Kalidas and Shakespeare and you name it. But this is what uh, a very famous um, American author had to say about words. So I'll read what he says from his book, uh, which we read at school, actually, before I went to university, a book he wrote called As I Lay Dying by uh, William Faulkner. Um, and then I'll read something by a Native American Indian. Uh, and just listen carefully, OK? And be glad that there are these authors who can say things so beautifully and so concisely. Yeah. So in, in honor of their minds and their ability, uh, I am reading these. You know, I, I can talk forever, but if I read some sense to you, it, it's, it's better. No? So this is William Faulkner in his book, As I Lay Dying, which is a very unusual book. And if you're interested in English literature, you can look at it. He's talking about words, yeah, words. I would think how words go straight up in a thin line, quick and harmless, and how terribly doing, doing things, action, goes along the earth, clinging to it so that after a while, the two lines are too far apart for the same person to straddle from one to the other. Okay, the words and action is somehow something on the ground. He's giving that image. Then there's a, a semicolon, and he says, and he remember, he said, I would think, and that sin and love and fear are just sounds that people who never sinned, nor loved, nor feared have for what they never had and cannot have until they forget the words. Maybe for some to understand that, but he's saying, this is वो शब्द हैं ऐसे चीजों के लिए जो कि वो कभी महसूस नहीं किए हैं और महसूस नहीं कर भी पाएंगे जब तक वो शब्दों को नहीं भूलेंगे समझ में आ रहा है तो शब्द जो है पकड़ता है आदमी को एक पिंजरे में और सब लोग इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं लव फियर हेट पाप एनीथिंग इट्स अ वर्ड राइट तो है क्या आखिर ये सोचना है सोचना क्या है <laughs> देखना है जिंदगी के साथ टकरा के लोगों के साथ टकरा के दुनिया के साथ टकरा के और टकराना तो एक थोड़ा यू नो गहरा शब्द है लेकिन एक एक रिश्ता बनाना है ना दुनिया के साथ अपने साथ लोगों के साथ दुनिया के साथ आर्टिस्ट तो यही करता है चाहे फिल्म बनाने वाला हो चाहे पोएट हो मतलब जो भी हो वो अपने जीवन के साथ टकरा रहा है ना or should be, unless he's just trying to show off, in which case 
it's not art it's just uh, entertainment aur wo aajkal thoda zyada hi entertainment hai hai na asli cheez nahi hai but that's my elitist uh, thought anyway now i want to read what i said i would on silence uh, which is connected with the poverty of words right agar ke agar kaha ja raha hai ke shabdon mein ek tarah ka garibi hai kuch adhura hai to phir shant khamosh rehne se kuch fayda hoga na kuch labh hoga yeah what's so we indians meaning native north american indians who by the way have definitely a connection with tibetans it seems when the north american and uh, russian continents were joined at the little string of islands if you know geography there was no gap you could walk across when closer to the ice age there was land ice jo bhi hai a lot of people's are uh, migrated to and forth from that area and from the whole uh, indo tibetan uh, tibetan plateau china across through siberia to north america what is now north america canada alaska yes sir aap naksha dekh lijiye usme aapko pata lagega so anyway we indians know about silence we're not afraid of it in fact for us silence is more powerful than words our elders were trained in the ways of silence and they handed over this knowledge to us observe listen and then act they would tell us that was the manner of living with you he's speaking to i think the west or do you know to modern people with you and he might as well be talking to us in delhi right modern people in india with you it's just the opposite you learn by talking you reward the children that talk the most at school in your parties you all try to talk at the same time in your work you are always having meetings in which everybody interrupts everybody and all talk 5 10 or 100 times and you call that quote unquote solving a problem when you are in a room and there is silence you get nervous you must fill the space with sounds so you talk compulsorily that might have been compulsively but anyway written compulsorily even before you know what you are going to say hota hai ya nahi mere sath to hota hai what white people acha okay, white people main to gora hi hu white people love to discuss love to discuss they don't even allow the other person to finish a sentence maine ye dekha hai i find it very disturbing wo main bhi karta hu they don't even allow the other person to finish a sentence they always interrupt for us indians this looks like bad manners or even stupidity if you start talking i'm not going to interrupt you i will listen maybe i'll stop listening if i don't like what you are saying but i won't interrupt you when you finish speaking i'll make up my mind about what you said but i will not tell you i don't agree unless it is important hmm yeah television anchors ko batana chahiye otherwise i'll just keep quiet and i'll go away you've told me all i need to know there's no more to be said but this is not enough for the majority of white people people should regard their words as seeds seeds beej they should sow them and then allow them to grow in silence our elders taught us that the earth is always talking to us 
but we should keep silent in order to hear her. I'll repeat that sentence. Our elders taught us that the earth is always talking to us, but we should keep silent in order to hear her. There are many voices besides ours, many voices. So this is, I think, a lady called Ella Deloria, who is a native North American. Hmm. So, of course, my days at Oxford were full of words. We got a list of six or seven books to read every week, because we wrote one essay a week. On very short, quick, fast terms, 10 weeks. Bhoat kuch padna padta tha, bhoat kuch sochna padta tha, bhoat kuch likhna padta tha. So the, a kind of indigestion would set in or would, would just learn to be clever in a way, smart, but maybe not very deep. I think I wrote some good essays. When I did, I knew, because the tutor, whom we call Don, Dons in Oxford, which is not to be confused with a Mumbai Don, who comes to your house with a pistol, or whose goons come to your house with a pistol, the dawn at Oxford, when I wrote a good essay, my history dawn would open the cupboard and would bring out some very, well, it was quite good quality, sherry, which is an alcoholic drink. It was delicious. So there I developed a taste for sherry. And by the way, Bristol's Harvey cream sherry is one of the best. Anyway, shouldn't be talking much about alcohol in a Buddhist center, but there you go. Uh <clears throat> But words, it's all about words. So in uh, Buddhist society, which I joined at Oxford, one week we would do meditation, Zen meditation, which mercifully was silent, no speaking for 25 minutes. Then I think we had some discussion. And alternate weeks, we would then have a visiting speaker. And of course, at Oxford, we attracted some good speakers. Some were professors at the university. Others were from outside. And that's where I met the people I finally joined up with in the north of England. I took a five-day course and became a card-carrying Buddhist. The card to ne dete, but you take uh, refuge. You take uh, refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Feeling that everything, or one's supposed to feel that everything one has taken refuge in, in life up till then, like sex, drugs, rock and roll, reading, sleeping, walking, gardening all those are okay but you know ultimate refuge who will never deceive us is the teaching of the buddha not even the buddha himself but his teachings after all the doctor is important but what's most important is the medicine right we don't take the doctor home uh, eat eat the doctor we eat the medicine so the dharma the dhamma the dharma that which holds us back from suffering that's important so anyway, I took refuge there because uh, my mind was ripe. <clears throat> it was ripe because of suffering and also investigation, curiosity, a mixture of those things. And my mother was also very sick and dying. So there's nothing like death sometimes to provoke one to look more deeply at things and to stop one wasting one's life completely. Um, but then even then, unfortunately, uh, death death of other people can be incredibly powerful. Of course, especially if you have deep contact with them or parent or friend, deep, you know, partner. But it's, it's amazing how quickly so-called ordinary life takes over. And one uh, again, just allows daily habits to seep into life and you, and you forget the inevitability and the fact that death is always there just over one's shoulder. You know, when one really forgets that. So that, um, as Milarepa, the great 11th century yogi from Tibet said, you know, toss to the winds your concern for this life and bring to your mind the unknown time of your death. Remembering the pain of samsara, why long for the unnecessary. When you know, you know, when you don't know at all when you're going to die, 
Of course, there's another logic there, isn't there? Some Sarek logic will say, Tabito, I'm trying to enjoy myself the most, you know, because I might die tonight. So I want to go to the movies or the party now, you know, <laughs> so let me enjoy before then. But uh, as you know, it doesn't quite work that way. One needs to be aware. And it's one of the first meditations one engages in uh, yeah. on the path. So how I uh, came from Oxford to India is uh, due to Bodh Gaya, due to the Buddha's enlightenment place, and my teacher wanting me to come and help start a center there. So I came back at the age of 27. And I've been back in India since then, which is uh, land of my birth. Yeah. So <clears throat> several things uh, I want to discuss with you. But uh, since I'm a very, in some ways, a very matter-of-fact person, and uh, don't stand on ceremony. I would like you to sit quietly for a few minutes, just digest what I've said so far, for a very, uh, very good personal reason, which is that I need to go to the bathroom and empty my bladder, because I had too much coffee this morning. I had a big cup of filter coffee, so I'm going to go and empty my bladder, and I would like you to just reflect a little bit on what I said so far, so that when I come back, I can focus on what I want to say and not on my bladder. You know? Because as you youngsters uh, don't know yet, when you get older, you shouldn't have a big mug of coffee before a dharma talk. <laughs> okay? So you please um, just relax. Uh, you can think about what I said. You, Some of you are taking notes, I see which is very, uh, very, uh, was very virtuous, I'm sure. But also with the words, please think of the meaning. Perhaps, yeah, what would be really good is think of a few words which are important to you in your life. And consider what has been said about the poverty of words and the nobility of silence. Okay? And I'll be back very soon. No, I won't get distracted on the way. <clears throat>
<laughs> okay, thank you for your patience. So I hope you got some sense of how words are important, but they are words. And it reminds me of a very important Buddhist teaching that is given that our Tibetan, my Tibetan teachers have repeated certain times, and I've always found it very useful, which is that um, don't rely on the teacher, rely on the teaching. Don't rely on the words, rely on the meaning. Don't rely on the superficial meaning, rely on the deep meaning, the deeper meaning, the definitive meaning. And how to do that? Don't rely on a superficial state of mind, rely on a wisdom consciousness. So basically it's saying until we've developed a deeper awareness, a wisdom consciousness, we cannot understand the deeper meaning of most words. I mean, even a word like table, chair. We don't understand, according to Buddhist philosophy, or experience what is actually a table or chair. Just like a dog doesn't understand. Well, we know more than a dog. We don't, dogs don't go around speaking of tables. They think a table might be something to sit on. Some dogs I've seen in South X1, Kotla Mubarakpur, they like to go and sit on the top of cars. They think a car is a seat or something. Anyway, so we don't know, a dog doesn't know, a baby doesn't know what a table is, but we also we don't know really what a table is. Modern physicists can tell us a lot more about what a table is based on their knowledge of some atomic physics. We see a table in a certain way, but it's that's the appearance, it's not the reality. So my point is that um, whatever words we are using, we don't understand the deeper meaning we understand the superficial meaning. A table is a table. It's not a giraffe or a house. A table is a table. A clock is a clock. Take it. That relative truth of the table and clock is fine. It works. We need to know what we're talking about. But the deeper meaning of clock, table, and people studied this for many years in the monasteries, nunneries, monastic universities, Buddhist departments of universities and still don't understand it necessarily, meaning on a deep, deep level. Okay, so <clears throat> so good. I hope you had a, a, a useful few minutes to uh, to reflect or not reflect. I wanted to speak, I was thinking as I was emptying my bladder, which is a very relaxing, wonderful state of mind, right? And bodily being. I was remembering my grandfather because he was very important for me. And it shows us how much we depend on other people. I was saying, no, we're not self-made. The Buddhists would say we are dependent arisings. We depend on so many other factors. For me, grandfather, Scottish grandfather, was very important. Why? Uh, I was thinking of all the reasons. Because of nature, poetry, walking, music, trees, especially, of course, trees comes under nature. So he, through his influence, I learned about those things, about nature. He had a most beautiful garden in North London. I learned about trees and the goodness you could get from the leaves that fall off trees and can be used as a very good compost, humus, which you put in the garden, which turned his soil into dark, rich soil in North London out of the clay that he inherited when he got the house. Music. I remember being transported to other kind of mental spaces as a young, very young person listening to classical music with my grandfather in those big wireless radios we had in those days. Then his books, marvelous books he had, poetry books, history books, nature books, a lot of books on mountains and rivers, uh, and his, his beloved uh, Scotland, his mountains of Scotland, which some of you may have been introduced to in the James Bond movie, Skyfall. Any of you seen Skyfall? Towards the end of the movie, the location moves to Scotland, and it's just so beautiful, so beautiful. So that's the kind of landscapes my grandfather wandered in as a young man before he became a journalist and later came to live in London, <clears throat> North London. So he also taught me 
the importance of not getting caught up in rigidity regarding religion, because Grandad and I love to play table tennis, ping pong, on the dining room table. He had a net, he put up a net, and it was basically the dining room table. But what he would love to do, sometimes to my annoyance, he would stop playing, okay, and he would go into a huge talk about what has been done in the name of religion. This is partly because his, his father, my great-grandfather, was a great preacher, although quite radical. But my granddad became somewhat a-religious, anti-religious. But he would say, what has been done in the name of religion? And he would talk about how basically Christians had fought with each other, Protestants and Catholics, and how they had burnt each other alive, and all of those things that happened. It was very juicy stories I heard, but he would tell it again and again, so I must have heard it dozens of times. Uh, and then we would get back to the game, the ping pong. Um, the other reason I remember that is because behind him, and sometimes behind me, there's this beautifully constructed fireplace, you understand fireplace where you can light a real fire in the house and the house doesn't catch fire because it's built properly and the smoke goes up the chimney. You know, we have houses like that in North India, right? In the hills. So it was so beautifully made out of bricks, beautifully made. And grandfather used to say, I remember the, uh, the, uh, the Mason who made this um, fireplace, even he said, Mr. Walsh, I have to say, I've done a good job here. You know, he was proud of his, it's a beautiful fireplace. I don't have a photo, never took a photo of it, never thought of taking a photo of it. Anyway, so there's that sense of beauty, of aesthetics. And then my grandfather, whom I love very much, <clears throat> because of the nature and the music and the words and the poetry which he used to recite while walking with me. And then this beautiful bookcase, uh, a fireplace. Of course, there were beautiful bookcases in the house as well. The fireplace was exquisitely made and it reminded me, it reminds me now of a time when people took time over things. They weren't in a hurry. They were real craftsmen. Well, of course, they are still real craftsmen in, in India, around the world. Of course, we like to display them in a kind of entertaining way at festivals and so forth. But uh, there, yeah, in those days, it was much more the norm that people were not in a big hurry. There were far fewer people, of course. And they took great pride in their work, which they did properly and slowly. Yeah. Does that ring any bells for people? <clears throat> Sorry, I have my hearing aid on today after a long time. Everything is so loud. It's amazing. Modern technology. So there's a mantra which I like to recite. Some of you have heard it. It's not a... It's not a Buddhist mantra, but it might as well be a Buddhist mantra. Um, and it goes like this. <clears throat> Some of you will remember it. Uh, it says, slow down, pay attention, do good work, love your neighbor, love your place, stay in your place, Settle for less, enjoy it more. I repeat that now. Slow down, pay attention, do good work, love your neighbor. Love your place. Stay in your place. Settle for less. Enjoy it more. Hmm. So that for me is an extraordinary and timely and important uh, a mantra, you could say. It can be repeated again and again. It can have an effect on the mind. I often feel I'm lucky to have been born in the middle of the 20th century when we still wrote letters painstakingly and enjoyed it. 
put it in an envelope, paste, you know, put a stamp on it, walk to the post office, put it in the letterbox. Of course, yeah, first got a stamp or, and then, yeah, we knew to wait. We didn't get a reply in 10 seconds. It wasn't WhatsApp. And if I wrote letters to England when I was in India or vice versa, yeah, you might get a reply in seven, eight days. The post was very good sometimes, very fast. Satar din mein jawab mile, to one was saying, wow. Abhi saat aat minute deri kijega, to aapka dost, wo aapko gali dega. Mene abhi message bheja, phone kiya, kyun ne jawab diye. So we need to slow down and pay attention. Because when you speed up, you don't notice things. I always enjoy flying to Bodh Gaya, which I do occasionally to Gaya, but then you miss a lot when you fly. You look down and it's amazing in one way. It's all these fields. Or when you go Gyaragante, Rajdhani, then you see more, although it's an overnight journey usually in the Rajdhani. Uh, a friend, a friend, kya, associate who, um, yeah, someone I only met last June. May, June, man from Switzerland, looks like Jesus Christ. You saw him in the street, you say, wow, are you, are you, uh, you know, auditioning for a role of Christ? He speaks Hindi, he's from Switzerland. He was the audiovisual in charge of the first Hindi course we gave at Tushita Dharamsala Center last year. So I met him by chance in Bodh Gaya last week. And what had he done? He'd walked all the way from Dharamsala to Bodh Gaya in three months, because he did roundabout. He wasn't interested in a straight line, you know, aeroplanes do straight lines, almost. <coughs> the train journey is uh, 999 or 998 kilometers by Rajdhani, Delhi Gaya. He took, uh, he said he walked about three and a half thousand kilometers to come here from Dharamsala. <clears throat> Time, what did he have? He didn't have a rucksack even, just kind of jola with and no change of clothing uh he had a small lota he had some haldi because he would like to add haldi to uh, food and drink he was given hospitality wherever he went stayed a lot in temples sometimes he stayed outside when he stayed outside he just prayed in the evening may it not rain too much at night and he said only once he uh, he maybe was rained on so I guess he was a guy who wasn't in a big hurry, <clears throat> you know? And it does something to someone to spend three months walking without a sort of political agenda or anything like that. I mean, I appreciate actually what some people do in the name of uh, whatever. But this was not a political walk in that sense. It was, uh, I don't know, it's hard to give it a word, a name. One has to, I guess, experience it to know what it is. <laughs> Most I've walked is uh, 13 days, 14 days in the north of England and in the Himalayas. Otherwise, I don't know what it is to walk three months. Must do something to you, apart from give you strong legs or painful legs, you know, and an appetite for the fresh air. Anyway, wonderful, I think, to slow down and pay attention because then you really see things. You receive hospitality. You can talk to people. You can appreciate nature. You can appreciate many things. You can see how sometimes modern technology and buildings are devastating the landscapes. You can see it much more easily if you walk past it. From the air, in one way, everything looks quite beautiful. Just as from space, the planet looks very beautiful, right? You see in the pictures of uh, sp the planet from space, it all looks very beautiful, white and blue and brown. You can't see the slums, you can't see the plastic, you can't see the ocean of garbage swimming in the North Pacific Ocean, apparently there, larger than the size, much larger than the size of England. The whole continent of garbage floating in some portion of the North uh, I think Pacific, also Atlantic, has a lot of garbage. Understandably, where do you put it? You know, all these things you're ordering online, where do you think all that stuff goes? It can't all be recycled, right? So anyway, um, maybe you didn't want to hear about this. You want me to get more spiritual, um, which is another thing I want to talk about. What is spiritual? 
and what is not spiritual, what is sacred and what is not sacred, is being a holy person with a beard or maroon robes, is that sacred, is that holy, is anything other than that not holy? Is our daily life holy and sacred or only if you're in a temple or meditation center? Is that the only sacred holy place where you should take off your shoes and uh, you know, start to you know, put your hands together? <clears throat> Would we not put our hands together seeing something outside of a temple or a masjid or vihara? <clears throat> I'm reading from um, G.K. Chesterton, who was a British author. I didn't Google him, so I can't give you more information, but you can Google him and get all the physical facts of his life. So he's talking about the sacredness and the beauty, the mystery, the spirituality of ordinary life, daily life. A sense of wonder. Okay, a very remarkable person once told me that the greatest wisdom was to be surprised at everything. That he, that Chesterton possessed this sense of wonder can be seen from even the briefest glance at his poems. Excuse me? Could I repeat what I said? Yeah. Um, a very remarkable person once told me that the greatest wisdom was to be surprised at everything. <clears throat> so, surprised at everything, yeah. Of course, all words have to be somehow, do they? Do they, all words need a commentary? Very often. Or a silence. <laughs> then you understand more what the person is saying. But you'll hear... What he says is this, the sense of wonder expresses itself in gratitude. The aim of life, Chesterton says in his autobiography, is appreciation. There's no sense in not appreciating things. And there's no sense in having more of them if you have less appreciation of them. So, you know, settle for less, enjoy it more. And he takes the modern optimist to task for despising humble and elementary things. Because human beings in their scientific omnipotence can create such superior so-called varieties of things. Ordinary experience, I'm skipping a lot, this is a Beautiful article by Alan Watts, who was uh, a Taoist uh, from a magazine which I kept uh, very carefully from 1998. <clears throat> Resurgence magazine, a very great magazine, uh, edited by a Jain, ex-Jain monk, Satish Kumar, who was born in Rajasthan, a Jain family, and who walked all the way to Europe, gave up his robes, walked to Europe, married an English woman, settled in England, started the London School of Peace and Nonviolence, and then became editor of uh, Resurgence magazine, which um, in the early days, they had a subtitle of Patani, then they didn't have so much, but they're an ecological spiritual magazine. Uh, now they call themselves, I think, an in, well, then in 1998, they called themselves an international forum for ecological and spiritual thinking. And it's still going, this magazine. And it was established in 1966, which is a very important year for me because it's the year we went back to England from India in a boat from Bombay, which is cheaper than flying in those days. So an Italian boat. Anyway, um, and also the year, of course, for those who know football, England won the World Cup in 1966. We beat Germany 4-2. And I was in the toilet for half of the match. I was so worried that England would lose. Uh, Germany equalized at full time, so we had to go into extra time. Anyway, um, 
ordinary experience, if you look at it in the right way, is nothing other than the supreme religious experience, which is the goal of all mystical endeavor. You may look beyond the stars for God and search for knowledge of him in all the philosophical and theological treatises in the world, yet we are standing face to face with him at every moment of our lives. In truth, there's nothing more surprising and mysterious than perfectly ordinary objects. There's nothing more wonderful than the astonishing fact that we are alive, that we breathe, eat, sleep, walk, laugh, cry. And the danger of scientific investigation is that in attempting to explain these mysteries, it may imagine that it has explained them away. And then he speaks about how people who think they can explain everything become rather proud and rigid and very serious. And then the world is no longer curious for them. They no longer have a sense of wonder. Everything is reduced to formulas and uh, short items which you can find easily on Google Swami. Hmm. The world no longer interests him, intrigues that person, because there's nothing left for him to explain. His knowledge acts as a great weight upon his soul, which drags him down to hell. Poetic language. But if he were a true scientist, he would understand the paradox that the more you know, the more mysterious everything becomes, until you are forced to roar with laughter at your own efforts to make yourself the equal of God. So, of course, that's Christian and that's theistic language, but it's very similar to what we're saying in Buddhism. And I'm reminded that, you know, Dalai Lama Ji and my own teacher had the most amazing laughter. Sometimes they would laugh so much. You're thinking, why are they laughing so much? Because in the morning they're teaching on suffering and the cause of suffering and how samsara is pain. So why are they laughing so much if everything is duk, duk, duk? Hansi kai so maybe, why do you think? Why a Sagar Bhai? Why would someone laugh so much as the Dalai Lama used to? Even now, and my teacher Lama Zoprimpache, late Lama Zoprimpache, why do they laugh so much if uh, life is suffering? According to Buddha, Dukkha, life is Dukkha. Even our so-called enjoyments, according to Buddha, is kind of a form of Dukkha. So why are these people laughing? Can you explain? Can you begin to explain? Sir, at the back. Huh? Maybe, maybe I can just attempt to explain. Please, it. please. It's everything. Words are always an attempt. Yes. Because they have sense that detachment means they have, they have abolished that sense of I, right? That, that we usually talk about. So, so how does that help? You get you don't you look at the things objectively. You actually don't get related, you know, connected with them. And so oh, it's... you don't get connected with them. But I just said everything is connected. Everything is dependent on something else. What's the point of thinking you're not connected with things? What? Ah, what do you mean by attachment? Attachment that comes with the ego. No, no. What does attachment mean for you? Actually, in, in order to satisfy your ego or self. Uh, okay, in order to satisfy your ego or self. So you uh, actually feel you have that sense of uh, attachment with the things around you. You mean you you want them? You want you cling to them? You mean? Then you don't get it. You get the pain. So if you have abolished that uh, I or self. So to abolish that sense of I, then you will not have that kind of attachment. So does that mean that we should, does that mean that we're all the same? That, that if there's no I, then who is it that eats and drinks and gets up and goes to the toilet and sleeps at night? Who is that if there's no I? There is an I that I think is more universal. I mean, okay, it's, it's good. Yeah. I... There is an I that exists. Yeah, you would agree. But there's a kind of a false side that we superimpose, yeah, which becomes very self-centered and very self-protective uh, and self-important also sometimes. We really think we are, you know, really something. 
that you know I'm more important not just than you but maybe the whole universe you know really I'm the center people should revolve around me you know like people thought the sun revolved around the earth um, and so forth yeah so um, G lighter note is my humor not enough for this session you want to add humor I'm saying, uh, no, when you say that, I already, uh, the, the Dalai Lama and uh, all the teachers laugh. Mm. So I think they laugh because they understand the word suffer, not as the English word suffer, but the Hindi word suffer. Meaning? That's even worse. Because the Hindi word suffer means even your enjoyment is suffering. Suffering, suffer. Just suffering. Huh? Journey. Journey. It's not the suffering. Oh, wow. You are punning. Okay, <laughs> suffer to hai. Ah. Very good, very good. Thik hai, thik hai, thik hai. Ah, suffer to hai. Uh, uh, a suffering suffer. Um, yeah, everything is painful. But the great paradox, I guess, which one comes across again and again in spirituality with the, is, 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 is paradox. It is suffering, but it is also on another level not suffering. There's an eye, but there's not an eye. Haanji. We laugh at how things are working themselves out. Mm. People are so entirely. Mm. Maya bull thing. What do you think? So I got asked you in the beginning. Maya hai. When you write a film ka script, do you want to engage with Maya? Or with Lakshmi? Or with who? Who are you engaging with? Maya is the actual socialism. Sochne se. Soch. Soch vichar. Hmm. What you mean trying to give paying a... Attention. Huh? Paying attention. Paying attention. To what? Hmm. And is there a sense of unreality sometimes that comes when you engage with things? Yeah, I think so. It's like yesterday's dispute or yesterday's love affair or yesterday's whatever. It, it seems like a dream. It seems like it was all, all, it's all very weird somehow. It's kind of mixed up. It's not, it's somehow. The more you get aware, the more you would laugh at it. Yeah. There's this is uh, interesting. Um, I think Pema Chodron writes in one of her books. She's a famous uh, Western nun who writes wonderful books. She said, uh, Chogun Trungpa Rinpoche was sitting in a garden together with Dingo Chensa Rinpoche, who was a very, very great lama, one of the teachers of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They were sitting, having a conversation. And she could, or somebody overheard Chögyam Trungpa saying to this great lama, uh, Dingo Chensa Rinpoche, pointing to an object saying, they call that a tree. And then they're both laughing a <laughs> lot. They call that a tree. Matla, there was a tree there. They call that a tree. Matla, Human beings call that a tree and sort of giggling. So, God, are they crazy? Are these people, you know, having some Mexican, you know, Tibetan drug or something? But it's an interesting statement, you know. Oh, they call that a tree. Ha, 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 ha. You know, they call that a person. They call that a picture. Ha, ha, ha. Mm. We call, we, we give names to things. In order to identify a tree from a, you know, marigold or a house or a blade of grass, but which get it? He was saying yeah. one thing like uh what could be from that uh Buddha that uh so duke hai duk because duk hai because kamana hai the desire hai desire. So suppose uh Dalai Lama is the cause it has the he laughs because in the past kamana or do desire nahi hai. Mm. Because of Karuna. Yeah. Mm. He laughs because of Karuna. Shouldn't one cry because of Karuna? At people suffering? Why laughs? Karuna is compassion, no? Karuna, compassion, both in Angrezi. So, uska earth kya hai? Uska, uh, uska paribhasha kya hai? Karuna ka? Kya hai definition? Karuna ka? According to what? You have studied. Baba Sahib uses that word quite a bit in his mm -hmm. book, you know, by the way. 
So what is Karuna? Anybody? What is Karuna? Not Karuna. Karuna. It's part of it, but it's the beginning of it, perhaps. Beyond it. Beyond empathy. Sagar Bhai, you're looking very astonished as though everything, you're seeing the Maya of everything. So can Bhattai, yeah. please come back to Earth and tell me what Karuna is. You're artist type, na filmmaker, apne khwab mein rehte hain ke. I'm still waiting for my role, by the way, in your next script. Devi nahi karta. Haan ji? I do have a logo. But what is Karuna? So you have empathy and you want to do something right. About? About it. About what? What you have empathy for. What does one have empathy for? Except the suffering. Except the suffering. Yeah. Right, right. Right. So the classical simple definition is to wish for others to be free of their suffering. And as you say, to actually do something about it is best. But even to think that I want to free others from their suffering is very good. It's better than wanting to strangle them or whatever. So, But to actually do something and do it skillfully, that of course is amazing. And to do it without a sense of I or any sense of reward, that of course becomes what we call a paramita, a uh, Action gone beyond, gone beyond ego. Yeah, okay. Karuna. So you're saying with Karuna, there will be laughter. I'm saying with Karuna, there'll be tears, crying. What do you say? Yeah. Or did you have another meaning? Yeah, it will work like simultaneously. Huh? It, it works like simultaneously. But why the laughter? Why would the laughter come? If you see the suffering of a dying dog or a, a child who is dying of their wounds after a bombing raid, why would you laugh? Because they're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel by knowing the fourth noble truth that transcending sorrow is... Truth. What if you... Yeah, by knowing. So you're saying there's there may be a child dying in a hospital... Uh, but, as the Gita says, nobody dies. Would you be saying that? Nobody really dies? So what, you're saying that maybe the child will have a good rebirth? What are you saying? Maybe it's just purification and the dying rebirth. Would that stop you? I hope that wouldn't stop one trying to help the child. Or pray for the child if they were a long way away and you couldn't do anything. You know, there are causes and conditions. So mm. You would probably want to contribute towards the condition that causes and create them. Mm. If there is karuna and mudita. Right. Then one would want to also what is mudita? You use the shabd mudita. What is that? It's synonymous with karuna, which is like. Uh, no, you can't get away with that. It has a specific meaning. It's one of the four immeasurables, no? So, what does it mean? Be different from Karuna. There is Karuna, there is Maitri or Metta in Pali. There is uh, Upekha, which is equanimity. What is Mudita? It's the fourth uh, of the immeasurables. Come on, all students. Empathetic no, joy, no. Kabiji. Ah, good online. Sorry. And I yeah, Kabiji, please don't forget us on. Uh, Zoom squares. There are um, some things on the chat as well. <laughs> I can't see your faces. That's why I'm not. Con why can't I see the faces? Can you? I want all of the people in front of me. Kya ho gaya? Mere computer pe. It was. Oh, wo aa jata hai. Switched off their videos to be. Ah, wo bar bar do hi ho jate hain. Because they have switched off the videos to be. Like, yeah. still you get the squares, na? You one knows who is there. At least I like to see the squares and the names. Not the squares, sorry, the rectangles. Is there a sort gallery by? No. There's a gallery view on the speaker view. What's the computer? Anyway, okay, I can't see all of you, but uh, there's Professor Chaudhary. And there are quite a few people, including some people who know a lot more than I do. So I really feel now very embarrassed. 
Nick Redmond is there, Apurva is there, Sonali ji may be there hiding, uh, Soumya, Professor Chaudhary. Yeah, all these people, uh, Nivita is there, goodness me, in between her homework. Yeah, yeah, both log hain. Sujitwa hai, he knows much more. Anyway, uh, thank you all of you. What was my question? I've forgotten. What is Mudita, ah, old student? Namanji, you were saying? Kaviji, I was saying empathetic joy. Thank you. Empathetic joy or sympathetic joy, yeah. Can also be rendered as, in a sense, yeah, yeah, sympathetic joy, which would also include things like rejoicing. If someone is happy or doing better than oneself or is, is, is richer or more beautiful or more handsome or whatever, then one rejoices in that rather than feeling, you know, bitterness or envy or something like that. So, yeah, mudita. It is not just compassion, Minotiji. It's, of course, it's connected. They're all connected. The more compassion one has, the more one will easily develop mudita, I'm sure, and vice versa. Okay, so <clears throat> the more mysterious everything becomes until you are forced to roar with laughter at your own efforts to make yourself the equal of God. So if instead of God, you use the word ultimate truth, ultimate reality, which some theologians have, by the way, some forward-looking, open-minded theologians have said, God, don't use the word God. You can use the word ultimate truth, ultimate reality, the ground of reality. There was a famous, I think, Protestant theologian called Paul Tillich. The Courage to Be was one of his books, Paul Tillich. The courage to be. In that he says, uh, you know, God is uh, just a word, of course. Uh, what is it? He's not an old man up there in the clouds, you know, smoking a hookah or whatever he does. He's, um, he's, it's ultimate truth. The ground of our being. You know, the ground. Hmm. So anyway, um, saying a true scientist would uh, be very, very interested in the, what should we say, the present moment of things and not trying to analyze everything all the time. Of course, the other side to that is if you don't know how to analyze at all, how will you help someone who has, say, cancer or TB or something? You can't just look, be interested in it or say, oh, how wonderful, you know, how curious I am about your cancer. One would have to know more, right? One would have to know about the body. One would have to have some knowledge, quite a lot of knowledge. But then how to approach that knowledge, I guess, is part of the path from Oxford to Bodh Gaya, which is the title of the talk. Because at Oxford, everything was analyzed in a certain way. And I used to feel very sorry for my tutor, the one who used to give me sherry after good essays, because he was very plain to see he was quite a neurotic he, he would tie and untie his shoelaces again and again sometimes in front of one for, for no reason, uh, you know, in the class. Uh, he was obviously quite nervous, quite fidgety. Um, I didn't get the feeling that he was a very, you know, sort of grounded or happy person. And then when I read about what he specialized in uh, as a historian and, you know, upcoming and uh, obviously a good historian or became very, you know, important to be given that post as a don in the college. Uh, when I read what he'd specialized in, it was just almost laughable. He, you know, something about transportation, uh, logistics, in in some part of England in the 17th or 18th century, something like that. And of course, it could be, you could say it's fascinating, all the details, but somehow it just seemed to be that he was analyzing something to death and would have had hundreds of footnotes and very intelligent, sort of clever things to say about, uh, informed things to say about everything. But what did it really matter? And what did how did it really help? I guess I was in one way lucky and another way unlucky. In, in my second year at Oxford, my mother died. I knew she was dying. She had told me. But she passed away in my second year. And then other things, studying, staying on at Oxford, as I thought I might, didn't seem so important. 
uh, I was studying some very fascinating things, in, including Gandhi's, uh, you know, civil disobedience movement. And of course, the materials available in the libraries at Oxford was amazing. So one could have drawn that out and studied that for years, but I just didn't have the heart to do that. I wanted to get out, come back to India and work in rural development. That was my thing in my head then, uh, community development, <clears throat> rural development especially, because I didn't want to live in cities. Uh, so finally, many years later, I'm finding my wish, but <laughs> both guys also turning into a little city <laughs> uh, with the... Uh, unplanned uh, mushroom development. Anyway, um, so yeah, what is really important? What is really necessary in our life? This is something we need to always be aware of. You know, What do we feel is the most important thing we need to do in our life so that we don't waste our life? You know? Um, in, in that regard, I would say that um, you can again, get a lot of inspiration and teachings from literature. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, somebody called Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, who lived in the middle of the 19th century, who was an American who decided for a brief while to uh, leave the mainstream and live in the woods, very simply, in a place called Concord, which of course is an interesting word. It means, I think, peace and Concordia is peace or something in Latin. Uh, near Boston, not far from Boston, in Massachusetts, uh, Eastern uh, United States. And he wrote a very famous book called Walden, which is the German word for woods. So Walden or Life in the Woods was the title of that book. He was heavily influenced by uh, the transcendentalist movement, which in turn was influenced by, Hin uh, by Eastern uh, spirituality. And he quotes certain works in that book. But I want to read this, which is very important. It comes early on in the book. And again, this is a book my grandfather thrust into my hands, his own edition, and uh, told me about its virtues in the same way that he told me about the Bible. Although he wasn't, as I said, religious. But he said, Kabir, you must, or he wouldn't say Kabir, Kabir, you must read the Bible because of the exquisite English, the language of the Bible. He wouldn't have agreed with the theology, but the language of the revised or the revised King James version, not the modern versions, which ruin the dignity and beauty of the old English. But uh, the King James revised version of the early 17th century, he said, read that. And of course, I did read bits of it. And it's, you know, I think it's wonderful. It's amazing language. Anyway, this is what Thoreau says in the middle of the 19th century, remember, not 20th century, 19th century. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front or to confront only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. And not, when I came to di die, discover that I had not lived. You can know, the English is a bit old fashioned, but he's saying, I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear. Nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. Matla resignation matla chalo kuch nahi kar sakte. You know, resignation, not like that. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. To live so sturdily and Spartan like as to put to rout all that was not life. Okay, I have to translate some of this. I well remember my uh, uh, my uh, Indian uncles who are all from the kind of caste that loved to eat a lot of meat. So jab wo chicken ya mutton khate the na, to it wasn't enough to eat the flesh. They had to knock on the haddi or uh, you know suck the marrow out of the haddi. I'm sure some of you folks have done that, and you know you might now be vegan or vegetarian. So you know apne kya? 
आप तो आप तो किए होंगे उन शक्ल से लगता है आई वॉन्ट यू टू लिव डीप एंड सक आउट ऑल द मैर ऑफ लाइफ टू लिव सो स्टर्डली एंड स्पार्टन लाइक मतलब स्पार्टन स्पार्ट इज इन ग्रीस पार्ट ऑफ ग्रीस तो स्पार्टन ना यू कैन सी इन द मूवीज बड़े स्ट्रिक्ट होते थे बड़े यू नो बच्चों को नंगे चलाते थे ठंड में और ये सब होता था दे वुड मेक दम इन टू स्टर्डी पीपल यू नो स्पार्ट दे वर ऑल्सो नोन फॉर दर वो लाइक यू नो प्रावर्स सो ही वॉन्ट्स टू लिव क्लोज टू नेचर Spartan life is a bit of a joke because he didn't. He didn't do anything really Spartan. It's not like he, he, uh, you know, went out in the cold without clothes on. But you know, simple life, bolia, uh, uh, saral jivan. So as to put to rout, matlab, I say, cheese on go, pe vijay karna har matlab harana jo ke jivan se sambandit nahi tha. to cut a broad swave to shave close to drive life into a corner reduce it to its lowest terms matlab you know to really force oneself to come to the grips with actual living and to see you know and then there's uh, yeah for most men it appears to me uh, in a strange uncertainty about it about life and he uh, one of the most famous quotes from that book is uh, a very one line where he says that uh, most men live lives of quiet desperation this is a very powerful phrase most men live lives of quiet desperation hmm yeah in this regard one would really like to read something i'll get one of you to read it because it's in hindi and my hindi reading is not as good as my in the uh, speaking although that isn't very good either isko zara padhenge aap who is a good reader of hindi devanagari nobody main bharat mein baitha hu kahan baitha hu aaiye janab come here please and uh, just read this so it's only 8 9 lines very slowly you i mean you're not a fast nervous reader right aap badhiya padhenge na है ना हाँ आइए 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 ताकि ये ऑनलाइन वाले भी सुनाएं आप इसको पढ़िएगा कोई जल्दी नहीं है लाउडली हताशा से एक व्यक्ति बैठ गया था व्यक्ति को मैं जानता नहीं था हताशा को जानता था इसीलिए मैं उस व्यक्ति के पास गया मैंने हाथ बढ़ाया मेरा हाथ पकड़कर वह खड़ा हुआ मुझे वह नहीं जानता था मेरे हाथ बढ़ाने को जानता था हम दोनों साथ चले दोनों एक दूसरे को नहीं जानते थे साथ चलने को जानते थे फिर से पढ़िएगा वंस मोर सो वी गेट इट हताशा पीपल अंडरस्टैंड डिसअपॉइंटमेंट या मे बी इट्स इट्स नॉट एनीथिंग वर्स देन डिसअपॉइंटमेंट आई थिंक दैट शुड बी द राइट वर्ड ओके गुड गुड It's not despair. वो तो निराशा है ना Anyway, thank you. फिर से हताशा से एक व्यक्ति बैठ गया था व्यक्ति को मैं नहीं जानता था हताशा को जानता था इसलिए मैं उस व्यक्ति के पास गया मैंने हाथ बढ़ाया मेरा हाथ पकड़कर वह खड़ा हुआ मुझे वह नहीं जानता था मेरे हाथ बढ़ाने को जानता था हम दोनों साथ चले दोनों एक दूसरे को नहीं जानते थे साथ चलने को जानते थे ये है विनोद कुमार शुक्ल हता, हताशा से एक व्यक्ति बैठ गया था अतिरिक्त नहीं में तो विनोद कुमार शुक्ल इज द राइटर थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड आई एम इंडेटेड टू सुजीत प्रसाद फॉर सेंडिंग मी दैट पोएम एंड मेनी अदर ग्रेट पोएम्स एंड आई थिंक so sujit ji is was or is still yeah sujit ji is with us online thank you sujit ji for that uh, wonderful poem <clears throat> so this is it yeah hatasha mein hain sab log nirasha mein hain aur bechare chup chap apne nirasha mein hain koi haath badhata hai bahut kam badhate hain log haath jab badhate hain aur phir bahut kam log apna haath aage badhate hain और जब होता है तो थोड़ा सा राहत मिलता है 
वरना कोई राहत ही नहीं है ऐसे संसार के समुद्र में राहत ही नहीं है ये ये दुख की बात है ये लोग अपने धीरे धीरे पागल हो जा रहे हैं अपने मन में चुपचाप और ऐसे ही गुजर रहे हैं और मौत के वक्त क्या जाने क्या सोचते होंगे क्या हो रहा होगा उनके दिमाग में क्योंकि बौद्ध धर्म यह नहीं कहता है कि मौत के बाद तुरंत आप स्वर्ग पहुंच जाएंगे बोलते तो हैं कि स्वर्ग है सो 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 लेकिन स्वर्ग पहुंचना उतना आसान नहीं है लगता है हमें नहीं पता लेकिन स्वर्ग के कुछ कारण होंगे और कारण अगर नहीं है तो वहां पहुंचेंगे नहीं अगर खाली कानपुर का टिकट ले लेंगे तो गया नहीं पहुंचेंगे तो गया का टिकट लेना पड़ता है और ट्रेन में बैठना भी पड़ता है और ट्रेन पटरी से उतरना भी नहीं चाहिए बहुत चीजें हैं है ना एनी anyway, वे क्या बच गया एक तो अभी तक बोध गया पहुंचे या नहीं हाँ हाँ बोध गया पहुंचना इतना आसान नहीं है भाई साहब I got to Bodh Gaya due to the kindness of my teacher. I would say that, you know, and of course my own sanskars, but my teachers. Due to my teachers at, at Oxford, I learned the benefit of studying words and well, and to put effort at least all night in the library. Uh, sometimes with, of course, the wish to get some sherry, but also to please the teacher, and because there's. A lot of satisfaction in getting all the notes together and writing carefully in the quietness of the night. There's a lot of satisfaction in that. And I've never written so well as I wrote at that time. So there is something to that. And I gained a lot from those teachers as to, uh, to avoid unnecessary running around and to get to the essence of things by, by reading. And this is part of study, of course, which is emphasized in Buddhism as well. But I think my teachers at Oxford couldn't give me what my teachers of Buddhism gave me. The very first time I met a Buddhist teacher, a monk, small monk who, uh, I mean, a, a, a geshe of sh a short stature, who could hardly speak English. He had a small center in the south of Wales. Uh, he gave a five-day course, which is what I attended in the, in the Easter 1977, during my second year at university. So what I saw in him immediately was someone who seemed calm. He seemed quite clear. He seemed uh, very kind. Somehow he seemed very kind and, you know, sort of content, happy. I'd never seen these qualities in my uh, teachers at Oxford. I remember one teacher, especially who was teaching us uh, subjects in history related to economics, and he would be chain smoking throughout the uh, session, you know. Uh, it was allowed in those days. Nowadays, probably you wouldn't be allowed to chain smoke in front of students. But, um, you know, this teacher had a totally different, uh, the, the Buddhist teacher, the monk, the Geshe, or someone who's done a lot of study, was very different energy. And I was very taken by him and his teachings. And I remember one answer he gave to a question, which has stayed with me since. Uh, someone who later became a monk himself and uh, quite uh, important in one particular Buddhist organization. He was asked a question. It was his first course as well. He said, uh, Geshe-la. Uh, he didn't say geshe -la. We didn't know how to say geshe -la in those days. He just said, um, what, I don't understand what you've been teaching. I don't understand the meditation and what you've been teaching. And rather than give any involved kind of answer, uh, the Geshe just said, um, you have to study this. You have to listen and study again and again with patience. Don't expect to understand things immediately. You know, we're in a hurry. In the West, we've always been in a hurry. And it's, this disease has you know, now been transferred to India and other so-called developing nations. He said, you know, it's, it takes time. Again and again, you have to practice. Again and again, you have to study things. Again and again, you have to meditate. So that always, I, I'm not saying I follow that advice, but I remember that advice. Hmm. 
but we're in a hurry. We want a quick fix. And of course, there are many quick fixes available um, everywhere. And on YouTube, you get two or three or five minutes uh, of meditation advice or this or that. And I'm not saying it's bad, but it's just not enough, right? It's not enough. The words are not enough. We need to go to the meaning, the deeper meaning. And as the fourth thing I said, not with an ordinary state of mind, but with a wisdom consciousness, the deeper awareness, the wisdom mind. Do we all have wisdom mind? Yes. According to Buddha, we all have wisdom mind. It's just a little bit hidden, and for some of us, very hidden. That's all. We all have wisdom mind, potentially. We all, are, in other words, according to what we say, we all have Tathagata uh, Garbha. We all have Buddha nature. That's the saving factor. If we didn't have Buddha nature, all of this would be a waste of time. We would always just be scratching at the surface, just getting a few pleasures now and again, but we wouldn't go deep enough to find any kind of final peace or final satisfaction or deep, deep compassion and so forth. It would just be rather superficial. But because we have the Buddha nature, this deep awareness capacity, we can go very, very, very profoundly into wisdom and compassion, basically. Those are the two wings that we need. So Oxford gave me a lot of knowledge, a little bit of wisdom, perhaps. Of course, because living there, life brings a little wisdom, I suppose, but not anything close to what I got in five days of meditating at this college in the north of England, after which I took refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha, realizing that everything so far had been not enough, not the answer, if you like. Not the answer. Partial answer, yeah. Partial answer. So, of course, the Buddha, you could say, also found the final answer under the Bodhi tree at what is now called Bodhgaya. He was already very, very far ahead in, on his journey. And in fact, according to Mahayana Buddhism, he was already a Buddha before he was born. And that his life was simply to show certain ways of living. But whatever you take, that at a certain point he would not have been Buddha in his prehistory order. According to Theravada Buddhism, he was very, very highly realized person when he was born, but he wasn't yet a Buddha. He became a Buddha in that life through practice and so forth. Whichever way you look at it, and I find the Theravada way in some ways more inspiring, because you know, he started unenlightened, became enlightened in that life. Whatever. So Bodhgaya, he became awakened. So have I become awakened in Bodhgaya? Yeah, to certain things, to the local practices of police, of, uh, of uh, MLAs, of um, the farmer's life, what a farmer's life is, how much they work, how much they suffer how much they lose at the hands of, uh, you know, middle people and others. Uh, I see, I've seen a lot of real suffering in Bodhgaya. I've never seen anywhere else in the world, you know, a lot of discrimination. I've seen violence to an extent, so, you know, violence. So, I mean, a lot of mental violence. But I've also seen some very good people, and I've seen some good monks and nuns and other practitioners, and... Uh, being there at the main temple is a, a very special experience. If one can take time to be there, not be in a hurry, it's it's like a like an oasis. And as I said, it's very beautiful nowadays. People should go and experience it. Yeah. Uh, ten to one. We can go a little bit beyond one, but again, I'd like to take a short break for. An unmentionable reason, which you can guess. Um, so take a little break if you need one as well. I, and there's some somebody who very kindly gave me some delicious chocolates this morning. Please come, Yash, could you open the packages and share? And then we'll just have conversation when I come back. Mm -hmm. I've done enough talking. We can mm -hmm. have some discussion because the topics I'm talking about are endless, but we should have some discussion. Okay, so have have a stretch your legs. Is there any hot water for people? Or yes. Yeah, so please help yourself. I mm? Thank you. Got it. I don't know who's controlling things from the background, but there must be somebody. Mm -hmm. 
Oh. Come back soon, folks. आपका नाम क्या है पवित्र और आप कहा के हैं उड़ीसा एजुकेशन में ग्रेट कहाँ पे कहाँ पर है ओके लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन प्लीज कम बैक टू योर सीट सो वी कैन कंक्लूड Uh, the major of course similarities are they both emphasize have to emphasize uh, moral conduct concentration and wisdom what we say shil samadhi pragya but in addition mahayana from the very outset emphasizes mahakaruna great compassion which then becomes what we call bodhicitta which is the wish to become a buddha in order to save all beings from suffering and lead all of them to enlightenment theravada doesn't feel this is possible and aims for nirvan personal liberation from pain and suffering right mahayana says uh, that's not enough you have to save everybody what's the point of just saving yourself you're just one person so mahayan the bodhisattva ideal is to uh, attain the state of a buddha which of which we are all capable ultimately in order to benefit all sentient beings theek hai na so the motivation is very vast in the mahayana that's why it's called mahayana great vehicle yeah so the bodhisattva is someone who deliberately happily you could say keeps on taking birth wherever he or she is needed to benefit others who are suffering आत बढ़ाने के लिए स्किलफुल वेज इज दे सम नमकीन आई कुड हैव प्लीज इज दे मैंने मीठा खाया और वो थोड़ा ज्यादा मीठा हो गया आपने कुछ लिया नहीं है तो कोई नहीं लेकिन मीठा ज्यादा है सो या एनी क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम ऑनलाइन ओके दर इज अ चैट सॉरी आई बीन इग्नोरिंग यू when you are flowing like water without giving yourself any labels who suffers am i an i uh, an i am this or i am that when you go beyond calling yourself with anything but you just be your just flow you just be you just flow while laughing you become the very laughter bilkul very good corona is the act of seeing yourself in others seeing your suffering in theirs and free them from suffering just as you would do for yourself yeah that's very good thank you there's a beautiful quote in the i think katha katha upanishad katha upanishad hmm in one of the upanishads that he who sees himself in all others and others in himself is the true yogi something like that karuna is sanskrit as well as pali word it translates to compassion compassion yeah not loving kindness loving kindness is uh, maitri or metta professor yeah thank you what else is there good morning tash the leg okay that's some time back hmm any mm, question kabir ji ha ji um two things one uh, i think hatasha is uh would be synonymous to not to despair of course but more to frustration and exasperation between frustration and exasperation frustration frustration and exasperation so Fr i think a, a and hint, exasperation yeah yeah i think it's it's more likely to be kuntha the hindi word kuntha kuntha so aparyayvachi yeah so not uh, it wouldn't be thoros um, 
quiet desperation. It can be that as well. Hmm. Can be that as well. Hmm. Can be that. That's why I said it's between frustration and exasperation. Acha. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, that's 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 from Kavalya Upanishad, what you were co quoting. Thank you. Thank you, Kavalya Upanishad. We say in our little group that um, Sujit Ji is our walking encyclopedia, uh, spiritual and poetic encyclopedia. So thank you, Kevalya. I think Chandogya has something similar, but uh, probably not those words. And the Katha Upanishad was maybe the one which says, um, lo only love sees, only love knows, there is only love. Of course, that's the English translation. Sanskrit mein kya tha pata nahin. I remember reading that. Only love sees, only love knows, there is only love. Wow. Anyway, uh, thank you for that. Um, Stonali Vaid, who is our local, uh, well, she's in the Philippines right now. She's our activist. Uh, and also, most women live lives of vocal desperation. Why do you say that, Sonali ji? Are you still there? Vocal desperation. Ye kya ho hai? Kya aapka? Vocal. Did she mean vocal? Vocal. But of course, she's gone away now. No? She's uh, left. She's left her message and she's gone. Okay, she's an activist. She's running. Yes, ji? This is also a thing. Poor thing. She's working in the Philippines, and I don't know, maybe they have to work on a Sunday or whatever. So, yeah. What do you think about that? Vocal desperation. Hmm. Hmm? I think it's the same. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so, I like I think that how to know wisdom consciousness, one aspect, and one aspect is how to get into wisdom consciousness. How to get into wisdom consciousness? Mm -hmm. Study, reflection, meditation. That's the formula, which means we have to study about wisdom in words, listen to lectures, read, then discuss and think about it, reflect on it, using commentaries and again discussions with friends, with teachers, like-minded people. And then the third phase, without which nothing happens deeply, is to then go deeply into it with a meditative state of mind, which has already, hope, ideally been calmed with what we call the, the shamatha meditation, to make the mind very calm and still, which of course is very, very difficult, I think. Uh, possible, but difficult for us modern people especially, because we're so distracted. And it takes time also to develop that state of mind. So based on that focused state of mind, then we can go deeper. But it's a bit like slowing down and paying attention. When you slow down, pay attention, and you walk somewhere slowly instead of racing by in a motor car, you can see things you can't see when you are going fast. So slowing down, paying attention, things become, a, you could say in a sense, more profound could be one way. Just calmer. You can see things more clearly when the window is clean or the water is not disturbed by wind and rain, then things are reflected clearly in that water or in that window if the window is cleaner. So somehow slowing down, paying attention is something that is mentioned in many religions. The Bible has a phrase, be still, be still and know that I'm God. Meaning you won't recognize, you won't know what is God or anything if, you'd, if, if you're not still. Be still, and that means also, I think, mentally still, not just physically, obviously. Be still and know that I'm God. So in Buddhism we say, be still and know, you know the deeper truths. Become aware of your wisdom, consciousness, your, your Buddha nature, <clears throat> how things exist, all of that. So only practice. The people who have developed their wisdom consciousness are people who did the, who took all those steps. They studied, they reflected, they meditated, and they did it again and again and again. And there may have been some very gifted people who already done it a lot, we would say. 
in their past lives. So they don't need to do so much in this life, but they still need to do something. They still need to practice. And so I was talking of bodhisattvas, even people who are, they say, reincarnated in order to benefit others. And they are, some, they are recognized as, you know, the reincarnation of such and such teacher or whatever. Uh, even they undergo very intensive training, usually, to make sure their uh, good qualities are preserved and even maybe made stronger. <clears throat> What's the difference between reflection and meditation? Okay, good question. So take death, okay? So you read about death. Then you take, say, the first point, which in the teachings is death is definite, okay? Or take the second one, it's maybe the, the time of death is indefinite, is the second point of the teaching. So then you think, okay, what are all the reasonings that they are saying, you know, the time of death is indefinite? So then you think about all the different ways you could die, all the different things that happen to different people, to people you know, people in history, uh, even maybe oneself has come close to death, whatever. You go through that again and again, and you see how also time is running out. You know, all of those things you think about, you, you reflect with a thinking mind, with a conceptual mind. And then after you've done that, you just focus on the feeling that has arisen through that investigation. It's like you've made all of the, put all the ingredients together for say chapati or bread, let's take bread. All of those ingredients, you've kneaded it, you put it together, but then you have to put it in the oven, otherwise it won't get baked into proper bread. So meditation is like, you know, baking it really going into it deeply with a calm, quiet, and at a certain point, non-conceptual mind. So one is not just thinking, one feels it, intuits it at, at a much deeper level. So that's one way to look at it. But in the simple terms, meditation is said to be habituating the mind to that which is wholesome. Habituating the mind to what is wholesome, meaning any wholesome topic that leads one towards in the right direction towards more wisdom, more compassion. So meditation on death in any way, at whatever level, is also can be called a kind of meditation because you're habituating the mind to a topic that you need to know about, according to the Buddha. Or to meditate, to habituate your mind to what duk is, what the Buddha meant by duk, that would also be meditation. But the deeper meaning is the other definition is a complete and pure awareness without clinging. That's another definition, where you're going beyond conceptuality. A pure and complete awareness without clinging, without holding on to anything. Any word, any, any view, non-conceptual mind. So that's a deeper level. Deep... Uh, Pure and complete awareness without grasping, without clinging, without fixation. Some lamas would use that translation now, without any kind of fixation. That's used a lot in the in the Nyingma tradition. I haven't heard uh, really Gelukpa teachers use that word much, unless they're discussing uh, the Mahamudra teachings. Mental fixation is when you are you know, ordinarily we say you're fixated if you're kind of addicted to something, but here it means something much more subtle as well. You're fixated if you're holding on to an idea or a thought in any way, kind of holding on to it, and not totally spacious and letting go. There's a kind of a fixation. To know more about these things, you should read um, Mingyur Rinpoche, Sokni Rinpoche. They write very well on fixation. Any of those great teachers, uh, Urgen Tulku, uh, in that tradition, Chokini <clears throat> Rinpoche, they write on uh, fixation. Probably His Holiness Dalai Lama also is translate. I mean, they're obviously using a Tibetan word, which I don't know, I'm afraid. But of course, whenever Dalai Lama Ji teaches on Mahamudra or Zogchen, which he's totally capable of, uh, he's master of all of the traditions. Um, and that word is used. So, if I could go a little deeper into it, 
you have already reflected on it. So the cross questioning and all of that is over. That phase is over. You cross that stage. Now mm -hmm. you are, let's say, sitting with just the essence of what you've gained in that phase in the meditation. So even though when you're sitting with that essence, some imagery mm -hmm. will be coming up. Yeah. So that is part of meditation? or that It still is, but... Yeah, because there's levels of meditation, obviously, to get to the non-conceptual state is not easy at all. It's impossible for most of us at our level, because we don't have the initial shamatha mind, which is able to just be with a topic. Because let's remember, the definition of shamatha is one can stay on a topic or a, a, an object, let's say, the breath, let's say, you can stay with your breath for four hours without being distracted at all to anything else. You'll just be with the breath. So that, of course, is something, a very powerful state of mind already, where you can just focus on that or on an image of the Buddha or whatever you've taken. You can take that for four hours. Your mind doesn't go anywhere else. It stays with that, but it also stays clear. It's not in a zombie-like state, but it stays, it, it's awake. You're not in a trance. It's not trance. It's very clear very awake and yeah clear and awake clear and calm it's a calm mind but a very clear mind not calm and dull so that is all taught in the shamatha teachings on the different stages how different things become obstacles at different levels of the meditation but here we're talking about something beyond even very subtle sinking as they call it when the mind becomes loses its sharpness so if one were to have that state of mind, I imagine that going into deeper meditation becomes so much easier because the mind has been pacified of all of these sort of distractions. So one doesn't get excited and one doesn't become dull. Yeah. Four Which hours is literal or figurative? What is? Four hours that you mentioned. They say that's what it should be, at least four yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah, they don't just mean for a good 20 minutes, they mean four hours, which is why when the Dalai Lama first mentioned this to Western neuroscientists and psychologists, they didn't believe him. They thought, what is this? What are they? What are these Tibetans talking about? But then when they began to examine meditators and experiment on them and put them through their machines, they were amazed by, uh, you know, what the machines were telling them about the neural activity of these meditators they were amazed uh yeah so through very sophisticated modern instruments that has been a very important step in helping the scientists to see how extraordinary the uh, tibetan meditators are and including one westerner who was also tested who has gone very deeply into the meditations and uh, at an extraordinary level of uh, yeah, mental development, which which they was unheard of in the Western tradition of well, Western modern scientific tradition. So that's been the big point between science and spirituality. The, we Buddhists say, look, you scientists are trying to understand mind and the brain and consciousness with your limited, with your instruments which aren't capable of detecting consciousness. To understand consciousness, you have to use your mind, your consciousness itself. You have to become a contemplative scientist. The instruments can no longer tell you the whole story. You know, So to say that a uh, Tibetan Buddhist is being unscientific when he speaks about rebirth is, is for that scientist uns unscientific to say that. Because you don't have the instruments. You don't, you don't know what that person is experiencing or not experiencing. So how are you going to know? You have to do the practice yourself, which most scientists can't do. Most of us can't do. We can't spend years and years studying, meditating, getting to that level of awareness where we can control our death, control our rebirth, you know, remember our death and rebirth. Well, you know, who can remember that? So, of course, scientists will say it doesn't exist or, you know, how do you know our, sci our instruments are not you know, a Buddhist can easily say to a scientist, look, it's up to you to disprove rebirth. Which of your instruments can actually disprove that there is continuity of consciousness? Because you don't even know what consciousness is. 
your instruments are not showing you what is con the experience of consciousness itself. It's showing you the results of what we call consciousness on various parts of your brain. But it is not the consciousness itself. That you'll only know through meditating deeply, deeply. When you've gone beyond the uh, mental chatter, which is why the shamatha, the four hours ability is so important. You've gone beyond the normal, agitated, confused, chattering mind. Even the subtle aspects of it, you've gone beyond. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, you might say so, yeah. Although a lot of the Tibetan lamas have dreadful diets and uh, their bodies are very unhealthy. But them, and of course, sitting all day for many of them has made them very unhealthy. But their minds are at some different level. So at a certain point, they seem to go beyond that sort of new agey thing about you have to have a perfect body for a perfect mind or something like that. You you don't. A lot of the Hindu gurus you see on posters, hey, they don't look so fit. They don't look like Bollywood stars, do they? No, so that one body part is not very numb. Numb. You mean when, uh, when you sit? Well, there are stories, aren't there, of Hindu yogis? The birds are nestling in their hair and beards. And uh, yeah, I don't know whether their body is going numb or not. Their mind is somewhere else. You know? But yeah, for us, for me, I need to have a, a relatively healthy body and uh, and so on and so forth to be able to do any kind of practice. If I'm sick or had too much to eat or whatever, or haven't slept enough, it's very difficult. But yogic people, because they're, I think, accessing a different level of awareness and energy, they don't need all the things that you know I need. Lama Zopra Rinpoche never slept. Uh, he never lay down in his life after a certain point, because he'd taken that vow and he didn't need to. He was in meditation when, you know, at night or doing prayers and pujas for people. He didn't need to sleep in the way we sleep. And certainly didn't need to lie down. So you see, special things begin to happen for people who, uh, you know, utilize the power of the mind, <clears throat> which Western psychology is just barely aware of. Which is why even the Dalai Lama, who's usually very diplomatic and very careful, he said, you know, compared to Buddhist psychology and uh, understanding of the mind, he said, Western knowledge is like baby knowledge, you know. They're nowhere near understanding because they haven't gone into it with the power of the, you know, with the power of the focused mind. The book um, Attention Revolution by uh, B. Allen Wallace is very interesting in this regard. B. Allen Wallace, um, Attention Revolution, where he speaks about the power of the focus mind. Um, and that's just the focus mind, not necessarily the Vipassana mind in the Mahayana sense, not the Goenka sense, but the deep understanding wisdom mind. And he's not even talking about that so much, just the basic attentive mind, you know, a slow down, pay attention mind. It's an amazing book, <clears throat> Attention Revolution. And anything actually by Alan Wallace is usually very, very good. He writes brilliantly on uh, shamatha, mind training, science, spirituality. Um, mm, yeah. Well, so just basic. Uh, we sometimes have ten-day courses on compassion or on, um, yeah, like that. But usually, no longer than ten days. They're shorter courses, and in the winter months, unfortunately, we hope to extend it a little bit. But uh, yeah, not much happening March to September. <laughs> it's usually November to February. Short courses on introduction to Buddhism and. Uh, the same kind of topics we have at Tushita Dharamsala. It's just we don't have so many 10-day courses. Mm. If you want longer course, 10-day and longer course, you need to go to our center in Nepal, uh, Kopan Monastery, outside Kathmandu. Yeah, that has a lot. 
I'm going to have to stop now because I'm connected with my family and family expect me home for lunch. Um, but it's uh, been very good being with you and <clears throat> you've all been very patient. This discussion and topic can carry on for a long time. Uh, I mean, into other sessions. I might talk a bit about this kind of thing tomorrow, but we have a we have a kind of tourist group coming tomorrow but who are interested in Buddhism. So I'll be talking to them at 6.30 but I will, uh, you know, carry on certain themes from today's talk. But they'll mostly be beginners, so it'll be rather basic tomorrow. But could be good nevertheless. Um, <clears throat> and then on Tuesday, we have what's called a Guru Puja. Very important, uh, twice-monthly puja we do in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, with a lot of uh, prayers and uh, kind of ritual you might say but a lot of prayers and very good words in the prayers and so forth uh so guru puja 6 30 on tuesday so welcome to come to that that will also be online I want to thank all the people online the uh the 10 people still there thank you very very much uh all of you appreciate very much um <clears throat> hope it wasn't too much a waste of your time. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, we can dedicate uh, the positive energy we generated together for the happiness and welfare of all of us. And we're never being separated from authentic teachings and uh, authentic teachers. And for us to be able to develop our critical intelligence and our deep awareness, our wisdom awareness as well, wisdom consciousness, uh, which is another way of saying activating our Buddha nature so that we may be of more benefit to ourselves and others uh, at a time when this is very necessary. It's always been necessary, but somehow in this modern world we have the means to be so destructive so quickly. Uh, we need more and more sanity and clear insight and compassionate hearts. So uh, may that develop in us and in more and more people. Especially in education, may we be able to uh, help the teachers to flower in goodness, as Jiddu Krishnamurti would say. Or in Buddhist language, may they develop more and more wisdom and compassion, and uh, so they can live uh, in the world, um, helping others without fear. Fear is a big issue, as we know. We haven't really spoken about it in the talk, but to go beyond fear and anxiety Mm. and then the bodhisattva prayer that whoever has anything to do with us any contact with any of us may it benefit those people even if they're angry at us or abuse us may it, may they be benefited by their connection with us may it help them to awaken may we also get inspiration from uh, all manner of things nature other people literature music whatever it doesn't we don't have to only benefit from Buddhist texts, although they may be considered the most profound, but we can benefit from it, from everything. Sense of wonder and curiosity. And also reading great literature, or just literature I didn't mention, but today uh, a book that um, actually uh, Minotiji had given me some time back uh, on the conflict in Syria. You see, reading books like this about modern history and modern, you know, uh, topics, it can really help arouse one's uh, determination, one's compassion for people and appreciation of uh, people's courage. Yeah, people's courage. It's not just Buddhists and Hindus and whatever who have courage. Common people, everyone has courage, you know, which comes out in different circumstances. So may we have great courage, uh, which we need to help others and ourselves. <clears throat> Uh, may we uh, also uh, find ways to find more connections with people from other faiths and uh, in this way uh, create more harmony in the world. May all our teachers have long and healthy lives. May all their holy wishes be fulfilled. May His Holiness the Dalai Lama have a long and healthy life. <clears throat> and all the other great teachers of all the traditions and uh, all the religions, everyone, anyone who is really helping their students to become better human beings, may they have long and healthy lives. 
May the spiritual community always be in harmony. And as Shantideva says in his great text, may uh, people think of benefiting one another. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, I hope to see some of you again. Yeah. <clears throat>